Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this morning uh, in our message will be the conclusion of a series of messages we've been doing, uh, we've been doing during Advent, which is asking the question, why did the Son of God come into the world? And we talked about uh, the fact that he came into the world to take back what Satan had usurped. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 3, he promised to send that Messiah. We also see that during the temptations of Jesus, uh, uh, Satan tried to tempt him with the uh, glory and the authority of the world, which he had usurped from God in the first place. So Jesus came to take back the world from him. Secondly, it was to reveal the loving Father, that God so loved the world he sent his only begotten Son, that love is the hallmark of how God wants to deal with us, and that Jesus is in fact uh, the incarnation of that, the personification of that love of the Father for us. And then we talked about the fact that the Son of God came into the world to redeem all mankind from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation, something we could not re redeem ourselves from, something that God had to make a provision for. And he made the provision in the Lamb of God, uh, his Son, uh, to be the uh, acceptable sacrifices for our Son, as it says in 1 John, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he have loved us and given his son as a propitiation for our sins. So finally today we want to talk about the reason Jesus came. And that is to bring us a future and a hope. A future and a hope. People perish when they have no hope. I suppose, don't we say that, uh, he was overcome with hopelessness. When, when people become hopeless, they have no hope in their life. It's very hard for them to continue or to really accomplish anything or to really uh, encourage or be encouraged in order that their life might change. Jesus came to make sure that we have not only a future but a hope, that the hope in him will be realized in this future that he has given us. The prophet Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 29. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, they are thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God looks to give us that. That we live in this world with the happy anticipation of tomorrow and what God will accomplish in that day for us. The world without Jesus Christ knows nothing. It knows nothing of true hope, nothing of a future in heaven to which we have all been called by grace in Jesus Christ. So the literature uh, uh, is, uh, that is populating the shelves of our Christian bookstores around the country suggests that we are living in the very last days uh, before this appearing of Jesus Christ, the final advent, if you will, of Jesus coming into the world. And we are reminded to look for the signs of his appearing. Uh, these numerous books tell us that, and articles and lectures, they tell us about this, this is what Scripture has said and this is what we see happening. These signs are all around us, in effect, we are told. And we're here today, on this Sunday in Advent, the last Sunday in Advent before Christmas, to take time to embrace that future. The future with a hope that is carried indeed in the very life and person of the divine Messiah, Jesus Christ. When we stop to think about it, this time of year can become kind of a closed-in time. Uh, we have certain traditions that we do. We have certain decorations that we put up. Uh, we have all kinds of things uh, that uh, show us, that, that lock us or put us into the box of this season. And part of that is, is a societal, part of it is what we do also within our churches. And sometimes we may simply get lost in the season and not realize that it is to point to something, something much greater than just what we see around us. This kind of closed off world comes at Christmas time and it kind of shadows or overshadows the real Christmas reality, which is an invitation to, be, to open up to the vital hope and to the future which God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. So the whole history of Christmas event, which we celebrate in the church, 
talks about lives that have been completely transformed. If you think about the Christmas history that we have from Luke and from Matthew, we have a carpenter named Joseph ben Jacob, and he becomes the guardian of the divine Messiah. We have a very young uh, uh, woman named Mary from Nazareth, and we have her elderly cousin Elizabeth, both of whom are childless, both of one who is not married and one who is beyond childbirth uh, age, and yet they're both pregnant with children. God doing something remarkable and new. This was not supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen to either one of them. God is doing something. God is moving in a remarkable way. The grace of God is being poured out. And sometimes as we get caught up in Christmas traditions, we forget about that grace that he came to pour out in our lives as well. One of uh, the things I would like for you to do today maybe is kind of open your eyes a little bit and see beyond the trees and the, and the garlands and the, the red ribbons uh, and the traditions that we keep to point us to Christ to look beyond that to what we are to see. See right in front of you, in, in fact, today uh, and allow the faith of that loving Father to inform your sight and to break down all the barriers, whatever barriers may be keeping you from seeing this Christ in a new way in which he gives you this hope and this future that God has promised even in his person as he comes to you. The word has become made flesh. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only one from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what John said in 1 John chapter 1, I mean in John chapter 1 verse 14. Why is it that so many cannot see God uh, when, he comes to, uh, when he comes to them in their life? So many can't see that. And one of the things we were talking about in our Bible study this morning as we were studying in the Gospel of John, one of the things we were talking about uh, was how remarkable things happen in people's lives, but they either consider it simply to be good fortune or they can't give an explanation to it, but they don't want to explain it as if it really was a movement of God in their life. They're afraid to do that. And yet others can't wait to confess what God has done in their life, such as the man born blind in John chapter 9. Why are our eyes so closed to God's appearing in our midst? What is so attractive about the theory of the Big Bang or the evolving universe while a poor little baby in a manger who is the son of God so repulses our society, so much to the fact that you can't even publicly display a crash. You can't even publicly display a manger scene in a courthouse or on a public square. They become so repulsed by that. <laughs> and yet their imaginations can think anything else that they want. It is because it is so easy, too good to be true, is that why? It's, it's more of myth and magic than it is of history? Is that what people think? And maybe folks react with such disbelief because it means such a radical change in the way of their thinking doesn't have to be put on them. They don't have to worry about thinking that this could actually be true, that this actually happened, and that it has ramifications in my life, that I'm supposed to be transformed by this event. Not that I'm just flowing along in the history of evolution, and things just happen to me because they happen to me. Because that's the way the universe is. It's kind of a fatalism. No. It's very well directed. And God is directing it. And the focal point of that direction is what Jesus Christ has done. And is coming into the world and living his uh, just and righteous life. And pointing us to the Father. And dying for us on the cross and rising again. When Mary of Nazareth was confronted by the angel Gabriel's words, she responded, how can such a thing be possible? How can this happen since I'm not even married? And what was the answer? With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Now, why would this young girl in Nazareth accept that? Why would she accept with God all things were, were, were possible? Because she believed it. She believed that all things are possible with God. This is not something that was just a pious statement that she might say, or that she had heard someone else say, she really believed it. 
that with God all things are possible. Can you imagine how that transforms the way you look at the world? How that can transform the way you look at your life? Do you really believe that with God all things are possible? Dear friends, today we all things are still possible with God. Today. It didn't just happen back in biblical times. Those who loved him are called according to his purpose, who can accept the Son of God who lived in this world. With them, all things are possible. It makes no difference where you have come from. It doesn't matter where you are right now. God is offering you today, this day, at this very moment in your life, the good and gracious Father is offering you. Don't miss it now. He is offering you free for the taking because of his son's birth and into our sin-saturated world and dealing with that sin by his death, he is offering you a future and a hope. You may never have thought that you really had a future and a hope. Or maybe you've struggled with that. Or maybe you know someone who is. Well, all things are possible with God. And he can come into their lives and make that transformational move in their life. So that their vision, their eyes are open, and they can see that future and that hope. The question is, will you take this opportunity? Will you take the opportunity to do it? Will you not be afraid? Will you step out in faith? Zechariah was, afra was afraid there in the temple when he'd gone in to do his priestly duties, and the angel showed up and said, you know, you're going, your wife's going to have a son, and he's going to be the precursor of the, of the Messiah, you know. And, and he was afraid. So afraid was he, he couldn't, the, the, the angel said, well, I'm not going to make you speak until the child born. And yet Zechariah, when the time came to name the child, said he will be called John. Because that's what the angel had said. Elizabeth was afraid, but she obeyed. And because she obeyed, John the Baptist was born. And who is John the Baptist? John the Baptist is the one foretold by the prophets who would herald the coming of the Messiah. Jesus even said, if you will accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah. That is, he has the spirit of Elijah that was to come and, and to announce the arrival of the Messiah. Mary of Nazareth was afraid when Gabriel came to speak to her. Behold, she says, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Even though she was afraid, can you imagine, just imagine for a moment, in that society, a young woman who would be pregnant outside of marriage. She was liable in the law to being stoned, but certainly to be divorced from her, from her betrothed, which we read in Matthew's gospel, was what Joseph was, was not willing to do, expose her to public ridicule, which might lead to stoning, but rather to divorce her quietly and just not worry about it. That's what she was facing, yet she says in the midst of that, in the midst of this, uh, obviously, uh, a, a societal rejection, she says, let it be done to me, even as you have said, even as your word has said, in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Joseph was afraid. He was afraid. He didn't know quite what to do. What's he going to do with his pregnant fiance? So he takes her to Bethlehem in Judea as, as ordered, thereby fulfilling prophecy. Because he believed it, because he took her with him, he fulfills prophecy. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you be small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins were from of old, of ancient times. God's plan was always there. Ancient times, God's plan was already foreshadowed in the book of Genesis, right after Adam and Eve fell into sin, that this Messiah would show up and that the world would be saved through him. The Magi were afraid. Do you not think they were afraid when they were ordered to come to Herod's palace and to talk about what they're coming into this region for? Can you imagine... This is the Herod who put to death his, all the members of his family who might usurp his throne. He put them to death. And yet these men are coming in to say this to Herod. Uh, <clears throat> could you tell us where the one who is to be king of Israel was born? Now, what kind of courage did that take? Quite a bit, actually. But they did say that. The king of Israel. And they were told. 
and they followed the star to Bethlehem, despite the fact that they knew that Herod's spies would be after them. And when the angel then came to them and said, go back by another way. Do you not think they were afraid? Was not Joseph and Mary afraid when they had to hustle up this little child that was just born and hide off to, to Egypt to protect him from Herod? They were afraid, but they all acted. They all believed this one thing. All things are possible with God. Why would they not be? He loves us. Will fear of the wonder and the hope of a future saturated in God's grace and love keep you from obeying today? Keep you from obeying Him and His word in your life? When God comes to us to claim us, to take control of our futures, our lives will in fact be different. When we have said like Mary, let it be done to me even as you have said. And how much has he said in his holy word to us? That we have prayed would be active in our life. Is he going to be slow to do it? No, he won't. It will be accomplished. That for which he has sent his word will be accomplished. When God comes to us and claims us and takes control of our futures, that's when things change. And perhaps we will become more willing to risk when that happens. Maybe that, that thing that you have thought was, was too much for you to do, or that challenge which somebody has set before you, maybe now you'll say, you know, if God is in this, I'm going to put it to prayer. And if he causes it to happen, guess what? The doors will open and it'll happen. If that's what he wants me to do. Perhaps you will become more willing. And perhaps uh, God's call in your life uh, to live out your life on the, uh, as a Christian on the edge, so to speak, the edge of what? His final appearing. Because that's what Advent really points us toward. It's his final appearing. Where faith is exercised more intentionally. Where, you, where your hope is more than just an idle speculation about what might happen. And where forgiveness and love in fact become a way of life for you. Forgiveness and love starting right where you live and going out into your whole community. More than anything, I think Christian, Christ, uh, Christmas is about a clear vision of God's future plans for your life, for your life, in hope for tomorrow. He does not want you to, to wander in a wasteland of uncertainty and half-truths. He wants you to embrace what he has done for you in the very incarnation of his son into the world. It's a wonderful invitation that when he stands right before you this Christmas, this invitation that this marvelous creation of God that we live in has been redeemed by his son Jesus Christ and to proclaim what he has done for us in our life. So we're willing to give our testimony as to what God is for anyone who would ask us for the hope that we have. A dear friend of mine, Pastor Rodna Shekhar, which who I mentioned earlier, He's my translator. When I go to India, teach and preach, he translates for me. Uh, it's always uh, so funny. Uh, uh, he, he always says the same thing every time. Short sentences. Short sentences. <laughs> That's okay. Short sentences. Uh, I, I, I'm known for having run on sentences, you know. So, short sentences. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, Radna Shekhar has a little church, and this little church is in a small village. And this small village is about a kilometer or so from the coast, from the east coast of uh, India by the Bay of Bengal. And on Christmas Eve 2004, around, uh, I think around Christmas Eve, 2004, one of the worst tsunamis to ever hit India since 1883 hit that coast. Hit that coast. There is a uh, there is a uh, uh, lighthouse. Uh, I, you know the candy cane lighthouses you've seen. There's black and white stripes up and down. The English put it there on the coast, right at the Bay of Bengal. And uh, he showed me the watermark on halfway up that. Halfway up is how 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 deep the water was. The villagers on, on the coast, they, there's a little village on the coast of fishermen. And on Christmas Eve, they decided that they wanted to go out for the night catch. They liked to do the, the night catch for an early evening catch. But the 
elder of, the, of that village said to those families, about 30 or 40 families, he said to them, he said, no, this is the birthday of Jesus. Pastor's waiting for us at the church. We have to go to church. The entire village went to Pastor Ray, Rodney Shaker's church for Christmas Eve, and the tsunami struck. That while they were in church, it struck. Their entire village was wiped out. Not one building standing, and every boat destroyed. Every boat destroyed. But they were with him, celebrating the birthday of Jesus in that little church. So the question comes, will you embrace the future with hope? Overcoming all fear and trusting the loving Father whose will it is that you be saved and not lost. That you not be lost by the tsunamis of life, but that you be saved. It says in Psalm 37, verse 37, Mark the blameless and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. And it says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 18, There is surely future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. That's what you're being told today. That's what Christmas tells us every year. It will not be cut off. So we can come now. And we can begin to train our vision this Christmas, as has never been trained before, perhaps. Train it in word and sacrament in this very place. See him come. See him come to defeat the horrid enemy of all mankind, sin and death, and the devil. Show him the victorious Savior. We need to look up. We need to let the light of Christ shine in us as never before. Let the Holy Spirit really imbue us with his gifts. We need to see the Father revealed in the face of his Son, Jesus Christ, who has come to redeem us and redeem all those who have come to believe in him and to accept him as their Savior. Beckoning you for your future. Beckoning you with words of hope. It's, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, for in this hope you were saved. This hope of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Beckoning you to that future. This glorious future that he has come to share with you. He'll share it with you in the sacrament today, but he shares it with you every day as you confess him and live in him. For I know the thoughts that I think about you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, even into life everlasting. Amen.